uh, you know, in the next one hour, what we'll do is we'll just go over the program. Uh, and we will also, uh, we have two esteemed guests here from University of Arizona, uh, you know, and uh, uh, they're also there to help, uh, you know, answer any questions. We would love to keep this interactive, uh, as well as, uh, you know, just, uh, um, and they will talk about a little bit about the process of uh, applying for this program. It's a unique program, uh, the MSIS machine learning, you know, for, uh, uh, it's a high, you know, uh, what you call as the hybrid program. So I'm sure a lot of you have questions around it. Uh, so we'd love to help answer those questions. Yeah. So please feel free to ask all your questions. Uh, I believe in the in the Q and A section. Um, you know, because that's where uh, we have the team here, uh, Shweta and the rest of the team who are going to be managing the program. Uh, who will be also happy to answer those questions as you bring them up. And I'll also try to, you know, look them up uh, uh, in the Q&A chat and try to answer it as we go as well. Yeah. All right. So with that, uh, let's uh, let's begin. What I'll do is I'll, uh, if you go to the next slide, uh, we will uh, talk about, uh, I will introduce the, the uh, panelists here. And then we'll, what I'll do is I'll spend some time talking about the program itself. Uh, and then we would, uh, uh, I will request, uh, you know, Noel and Anil to talk a little bit about uh, about their slides, and uh, 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 you know, we can then uh, uh, jump on to answering any questions. Um, so uh, before that, let me introduce myself. I'm the president. My, so my name is Milan Kopika. Uh, I'm the president of Great Learning North America. Uh, you know, I essentially handle all the business, the operations, the partnerships. Um, you know, for Great Learning. Uh, who is Great Learning? Great Learning is this education company that uh, is, uh, you know, based out of Singapore. Uh, but today uh, we uh, have students that we teach from across 170 countries. I think um, the last I heard, we, we had 9 million students who had graduated from various programs. Um, and a lot of our focus has been, and it, that's where we always started, has always been on, you know, how do you bridge that gap between the skills that industry needs uh, and the skills that we have, right? Um, and that's especially relevant in today's times. In fact, this program is a great example of that, which is, uh, you know, this is about machine learning and data science. And that's an area where every day something new is coming up. Uh, forget, uh, you know, the employees, even the industry, even companies are trying to figure out how do they keep up? Right, and in that environment, it's uh, critical that one keeps upskilling themselves, and that was kind of where we saw a gap that you know uh, we were not able to keep up fast enough uh, in upskilling you know the workforce, and that's where um, uh, Great Learning was born. Um, and I'll speak a little bit about how we work. Uh, we we partner with various universities. Uh, you know, universities clearly do a great job of the business of teaching. Uh, but how do you do that in a way where you can teach, uh, uh, you know, and keep up with the skills that the industry is looking for? And that's what brings us to programs such as the MSIS machine learning, you know, where it has, it has been designed from the ground up to help you not just learn, but learn very relevant skills. And the best part, learn and apply it, apply it at your workplace, right? Um, and uh, we will talk a little bit more about the program. Before this, you know, I was um, uh, in the tech industry, started my career, uh, you know, in Silicon Valley, uh, worked at Google, worked at um, uh, uh, McKinsey, worked at this company called Qualtrix, which we took public. And, uh, and, and today, you know, I uh, focus a lot around education. Um, if you go to the next slide, uh, I'd love to introduce our panelists here. So we have Anil here. Uh, Anil is, uh, you know, he's a faculty, he, he's a, uh, a, a, a man of many, uh, many talents and, you know, wears many hats. Uh, he's a professor uh, and he teaches various subjects in marketing and international business. That's his specialization. Uh, but he also has been instrumental in trying to look at how to help uh, bring education to, you know, high quality education to, uh, you know, outside of the four walls of the Arizona campus, right? Uh, so he leads a lot of initiatives around, um, you know, Arizona uh, uh, International and you know, how do you uh, get the courses such as the MSIS machine learning 
to folks like us, you know, who are also working at the same time we want to learn. Uh, before that, he had spent uh, a, a career in the tech industry at Xerox. He was, you know, leading the sales there for an entire, uh, you know, region. Uh, and a lot of learnings that uh, he has from there is what he teaches today and he gives back to the, to the student community. So that is Anil uh, here. You know, Anil, welcome. Thanks for joining us. Um, and then if you go to the next slide, we have Noel here. So Noel has also been kind enough to join us. Uh, Noel is, you know, uh, uh, as you can tell just from everything that she's doing, she's extremely busy. Uh, and I really appreciate her making the time to join us here. Uh, she leads uh, everything around, you know, the visa process, the visa, uh, you know, how do you navigate your journey in getting that I-20? You know, what do, what do they look for? Um, and, um, uh, you know, especially it's relevant for this program because the hybrid program, the way it's designed is while in your first year, while you're working, wherever you are, you'll be working and studying. It's in your second year, the next two semesters that you will be coming to the U.S. Uh, to, 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 to Tucson, I'm sorry, <laughs> to Tucson um, to, uh, uh, to, to finish your, your uh, studies and, you know, get your OPT if you so desire to, to continue working in the U.S. And uh, Noel is here to help us uh, uh, navigate that journey. So Noel, again, thank you so much for uh, making time for us here. Uh, what I will do now is uh, just uh, quickly give you an overview about the program. Yeah, and uh, again, feel free to ask questions. I think a few questions are coming up. Um, I think a lot of questions around um, that you know I completed a certain degree, um, uh, and I guess the question is around you know uh, am I eligible for it? Right. So we'll we'll get to that. Uh, I think um, uh, the team here will will be answering those questions. In short, you know uh, what you need is. Uh, I believe it's uh, uh, to show 120 credits in, in, in your undergrad that you have successfully completed, right? So I'll let um, uh, Shweta answer that question here. Uh, what is duration in total months of program, semesters, fees, scholarships? Yes. So a lot of this information should be available online as well. And your program advisor that uh, you probably are speaking to, if you're not, you should have a program advisor reach out to you, yeah? But they'll be able to answer all these questions around the duration in in terms of you know months of the program. The good news is it's flexible. You can take as much as um, I think uh, twenty one months. But uh, you know if um, if your work permits, uh, if you can take more courses, you have that flexibility as well to take uh, more of these courses uh, and complete it in a shorter duration. Um, at least the. Um, uh, you know, the, the, the online portion that you'll be doing before you go to the U.S. Um, uh, the, the fees, again, uh, you know, the total fees are about you know, 34,000 net net, you know, all, uh, all in fees for both the, the first year and the second year. And I think uh, the team will answer that question. Um, uh, you know, the scholarships part, I think, again, the team can answer that question here. I think there are certain um, uh, certain scholarships that are given. Um, and I think, uh, again, Shweta will be able to clarify more uh, about that. Um, yes, Milind, uh, we can take all these questions towards the end of the presentation. Towards the end of the presentation, okay. okay. Yes. So I'll just keep going um, and the team is going to keep answering these questions. So let's let's jump into the, the little bit about the program. So what is this program about, right? Or rather, maybe I'll just instead of the what, you know, as, uh, as someone once said, let's start with the why, right? Why, why this program? Because that helps clarify what it is. Uh, so this is a program that has been started by the iSchool, the information school at Arizona, um, which is pretty interdisciplinary, right? It has, uh, um, and you'll see the faculty come from a variety of fields, from uh, computer science, from, uh, you know, from the social sciences, uh, uh, from the, um, uh, you know, the um, uh, psychology and the, and the liberal arts background. But there's one thing in common, which is data, right? Which is they're all looking at this, the world is getting a lot of data. Uh, and how do you uh, make sense of that? How do you use that to solve real problems? Um, and that's what the department is about. Information school, it's all about, you know, information. How do you make sense out of that information? How do you put that to use? Um, and this program was put together to address that very problem, which is, look, our students who are graduating from master's programs, yes, there might be somebody who is learning computer science, right? You might do an MS in CS, great program, 
absolutely a, a, a great program to also get jobs and so on. You might do a program on uh, an MS in um, um, uh, or an MBA, again, a great program, you know, you learn, you know, various business concepts, uh, you might do an MS in, in engineering, again, great, that's needed as well. However, data, there's one common thread across all of them, they're all looking at how to, you know, process this data and try to get to some insights, right. And th that is where, you know, data science and machine learning is this kind of cross disciplinary area where there wasn't a good a program to help train people on how to uh, how to you know uh, make sense of data applied in in different settings it requires learning a little bit about computer science a little bit about business a little bit about uh, engineering uh, and a little bit about you know statistics right and that's what this masters is you will see that the courses and you know again it should be there in the brochure that you would have got if not, reach out to your program advisor for it. But if you'll see, look at the lineup of courses and what they cover. It covers a lot about various data science concepts, statistics, Python. Uh, you will have to program. You will be taught to do that. Um, you'll be taught to you know, tell a story with data. You'll be taught to understand data, uh, visualize it, look at various state-of-the-art techniques, and most importantly, you'll be taught to apply that, you know, apply it in, in real world projects, right? Everything from create a recommendation engine for, um, uh, you know, for, um, uh, you know, Amazon's, uh, you know, shopping cart, right? Uh, or, you know, in a bank, how do people detect fraud? Um, uh, you know, or in, in, the, in the cyber world, you know, how do you detect, you know, uh, spam or something that is uh, malicious? Uh, business process automation, that's taking the world by storm today. Uh, there's, you know, um, what we are hearing about now, uh, technologies like chat GPT, right, GPT-4, uh, that's being used across businesses or a business are trying to figure out how to use that to, for example, from thousands of documents, uh, say a legal firm looking at thousands of documents, how do they pick that one document, that one case that help, will help them, and then how do you summarize it, and how do you put together some insights around it that they can present, you know, to the uh, I guess the judge or whoever. Uh, that's an example of how GPT or you know what do you call us large language models is being used today to automate various business processes. And uh, you will be learning. That will be one of the many modules that you will be learning. I believe in the um, uh, in the Info Five Five Five, the the text analysis course, right? Uh, the the NLP course on NLP and text analysis, uh, uh, where you'll be introduced to those concepts as well. So the point being that. All these cutting edge techniques and technologies that we hear about, right? And that businesses also are trying to figure out how do we, uh, how do we A, get the right talent and B, how do we, you know, uh, take advantage of this to get a competitive advantage, right? Uh, we will be teaching all those skills in this, in this master's program. And again, feel free to look up the brochure on all the modules that are taught there. If you go to the next slide, in terms of career opportunities, uh, you know, while again, uh, to be clear, you know, nobody can guarantee a job, right? But what we ca all can do is improve our chances of being able to, uh, uh, you know, be set up for success, being set up for, uh, you know, uh, going after such jobs, right? And here are some examples of where people land up, right? After they do, you know, a, a master's uh, in machine learning in data science. Uh, so, I don't have to uh, go over each and every point, but the point is that the the careers for somebody who is trained in using AI techniques, using machine learning techniques, using data science techniques, uh, and helping businesses who are struggling to figure out what do I do with all this data, you know, those are the ones who are going to be you know uh, well set up for jobs of the future, right? And we want each of you uh, to be in that category, yeah. So again, happy to talk more about careers later on if there are more questions there. Um, University of Arizona, right? And here, maybe what I'll do is, um, Anil, if it's okay, uh, I would love to hand it over to you to just talk a little bit about the university and you know um, a little bit about its history, about the program. And of course, I'm happy to uh, further chime in as well. Yeah, sure, Melinda. So uh, welcome to all attendees. Uh, it's a pleasure to have all of you here on this uh, on this webinar. Uh, we are delighted to be a partner with the Great Learning. Uh, they are an esteemed organization and we are very proud of uh, our collaboration with them. 
So one of the first things we want to uh, assure you is that um, our partnerships with the different organizations are very, very selective. Uh, so uh, as a director of corporate partnerships uh, at the University in Arizona International, we get a lot of inquiries from a lot of different kind of uh, online providers and uh, different organizations in India and everywhere else to become a partner with them uh, to provide ongoing education. Uh, we don't really um, uh, entertain many of these and we entertain very, very selective organizations who are very, very highly creditable uh, and who are going to share the university's vision and also are, uh, a, you know, highly ranked as we are uh, from, a, from a top level university. So having said that, University of Arizona was established in 1885 in Tucson, Arizona, which is on the west coast of the, of the U.S. It's a beautiful climate area, very sunny throughout the year. We have over 340 days of sunshine. It's the same climate as, it, as, as if you were in India in many ways. Uh, it's beautiful, clear skies all the time. Um, we are a, we are a, a state-run uh, public university uh, with over $2.2 billion in revenue in funding from the state and the federal government. Uh, we have a significantly large faculty at our over 3,090 uh, total faculty. Our classroom sizes are relatively very small in terms of ratio of students versus, uh, versus faculty. Uh, most of your computer science courses, you know, you'll have a ratio of maybe one to 40 or one to 50 at the, at the very most, if that uh, overall. Uh, as you can see, we are a large student body of about 46, 47,000 students, uh, where we are 36,000 undergrads and, and 10,000, um, you know, uh, graduate students. Our international diversity is extremely, um, uh, you know, prolific and we are about you know roughly around 3900 to 4000 international students right now from all parts of the world from over 170 different countries very diverse um, and no one um, country dominates uh, our our uh, diaspora uh, so you really enjoy a tremendously diverse and a very uh, healthy atmosphere at the University of Arizona um, so that, that, as I mentioned before, you know, we are highly ranked as well, rewards and recognition, as you can see, we are in the top 50 public university, the US News and World Report, uh, top 100 global university, US News and World Report of 2021, and we are at the top 0.47 in terms of, you know, different world university rankings. So, uh, very highly ranked programs, we have the number three uh, MIS program in the in the country uh, and many other top ranked programs as well. Uh, U Arizona ranks uh, extremely high in many different areas as per the previous slides. And here in terms of the exploring the program machine learning, uh, Milanda actually went through some of these guys, as you can see with two years of a hybrid program uh, online and plus Tucson, Arizona campus. Uh, it's one of the fastest growing job sectors with over 300,000 vacancies in the US alone. If you go on LinkedIn, you will find uh, scores and scores and hundreds of jobs in this area. Uh, job roles could be machine learning engineer, data scientist, computer and information research scientist, and opens the door to a very highly rewarding and a very highly paid career. Uh, we have a great faculty here at the university. Uh, a lot of your online courses as well that you are going to be uh, taking in your first year are actually uh, have been recorded and will be presented by University of Arizona faculty as well. Yeah. Slides. Thanks. Um, learning journey. Milan, do you want to take over and go through this? Yes. Yes. No, thanks. And thanks for that uh, introduction about, uh, you know, University of Arizona and, and the MSI's machine learning program in particular. Um, uh, you know, as everything, just want to attest to everything Anil said here, you know, it's a great program by, you know, a, a top university. And, uh, and that's what makes it special. Um, uh, you know, and in addition to all of that, you know, this program, that has been put together by the faculty, you know, it also comes back a full circle to where we started, which is, you know, we are all busy working professionals, right? We are all trying to 
advance in our career, while at the same time, we want to, we, we can see that uh, we need to acquire these skills that the industry is looking for. So the question is, how do I acquire these skills while I am working, right? And preferably while I'm also earning. Uh, and that's what this program is designed for. So the university has you know, kind of taken note of that and uh, uh, put, you know, brought this program for all of us where in our, in our first year, uh, and potentially for those of you who can take you know, multiple uh, courses faster, if your work permits, you could uh, maybe even finish that off sooner. But in your first year, 15 credits, right? So the total program, it would take 30 credits, right? 30 credits translates to 10 courses, right? So each course is uh, you know, about a semester long and it's three credits. So in all, you have to take 30 credits. Again, you can look at the entire course uh, list uh, on the brochure. Uh, but broadly, half of that is what you have to finish, uh, that you will be able to finish while you are working, right? So you don't have to quit your job, and that's the best part. While you're working, you will be able to uh, do these courses. The way it's designed is it's very carefully structured where, uh, you know, you will be reviewing, um, you know, high-quality lectures by the faculty. Essentially, what they teach in the classroom, they brought to you at the convenience of your home. Right. So you will be, uh, you know, you'll have a very well laid out schedule. So based on your um, uh, the way it will work is based on your your uh, whatever work you do, you know, you'll be able to say, all right, let me plan it out here. And you'll, your program manager will help you plan it out. But, you know, you can every week you'll have to review a certain set of lectures. And then, you know, on the weekends, you would have, uh, you know, our mentors who would help you, you know, work through any hands-on exercises, clarify any doubts that you may have, right? So those would be, there would be these live sessions where you'd be, you know, in a group, small group of about, say, 20 or so of you, you'd be working on various hands-on exercises, getting doubts clarified. Uh, and then you'll also have some live sessions, right, by the faculty who will also be joining in. I think uh, roughly a, a live session, uh, at least every month, there'll be a faculty, uh, who will be, you know, explaining uh, some of the concepts that uh, that are being taught here, as well as answering any questions that you may have, uh, as well as, uh, you know, talking a little bit, if time permits, about their own research and how they're applying these concepts and where the future, you know, trends are uh, on each of these topics, right? Because as we just discussed, each of these topics are going to be pretty cutting edge. It's in the second year uh, where you will be coming, you know, to the campus, right? Uh, you'll be coming to campus. So potentially, let's say, you know, if you were to come uh, next year in fall, right, you would be coming in fall, fall, uh, which is roughly uh, towards the end of August uh, to Tucson and then fall and then spring in, in the next two semesters, you should be able to finish up your remaining 15 credits, right, five courses. And potentially, you know, at that point, you can apply for what they call as an OPT, optional practical training if you choose to, you know, want to continue to work in the U.S. after that. Um, uh, this is a little bit about the program, you know, certain certain features that that uh, I think uh, we thought it would be important for you to know. Uh, first of all, it's a, it's a program from a top university, a very hands-on, you know, program, right? So uh, uh, how do you make sure, you know, especially your field like this, right? Uh, what we want all of you to graduate with it's not just a degree. Well, well, it's, a degree is great that you know uh, you, it will be an, a degree from a great top university. But in addition, you know you'll also be able to you know show and tell, right? That these are the projects. These are you know things that I learned, and let me show you what I've done, right? Um, it's very cost effective because in your first year, while you are learning, you are also earning, right? Uh, it, it brings down the cost of the overall program, you know, the overall master's program, and that's what the university, you know, was high on their minds on how do we help, you know, people get a great education in, a, in an affordable way. Um, you also get eligible for three years of OPT, optional practical training at the end of the program in the US. Okay, and uh, uh, you, you also have... Um, and there, there, are no, there are no GRE or TOEFL requirements. So that's another good thing. Uh, 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 sorry, I just want to clarify, there are no GRE requirements and no TOEFL requirements if you are you know, in, in certain countries, including India. Uh, in, in case of certain countries, please reach out to your program advisor and they'll be able to guide you on whether you do need either IELTS or TOEFL, some kind of an English requirement. Uh, English language proficiency requirement, but uh, there are many countries, including India, where you do not need it. 
Okay, so that's the good news. Um, and you know, no application fees, no um, WES evaluation required. Uh, and of course, you'll also have in all of this the support of Great Learning, who has partnered with Arizona uh, to to provide a great uh, you know experience here. Um, Career assistance. So here, I just want to spend some time because I'm sure this is on a lot of your minds. All right, so this is great. I'll get, you know, I'll be able to work in the, my first year while I'm uh, learning. I'll be able to finish my education in the U.S. And then what happens then? You know, how do I uh, go about getting getting my OPT? So you know, Arizona has fantastic resources. And again, you know, the uh, your program advisor would be happy to discuss this in more detail. But they have various uh, uh, access to various, you know, uh, uh, job boards, uh, uh, you know, job sites, uh, a place where um, uh, a place called Handshake, you know, portal where you can see all the jobs out there, whether it's internship or full time jobs, so to help you network. You also have the advantage of being connected to Arizona's alumni network which is you know, a huge, huge network of uh, very uh, uh, established folks across various industries right, and various leadership positions. So you will have access to all of that and more. Um, so again, uh, I'm happy to talk about any questions you may have there. Uh, if you go to the next slide, uh, again, this is more of the same various career resources that are available at University of Arizona. And that I briefly mentioned, mentorship, alumni network, handshake, uh, a life lab to further give you guidance and coaching on how to you know, personalize your career. Uh, and you should, you should take advantage of all of that. Yeah, so the university is there to help you. Um, with that, if you go to the next slide, uh, what I'll do here is Noel, uh, uh, we have Noel here who's an expert on everything about the I-20. Uh, so, Noel, I'll uh, request if you could just um, talk a little bit about about these slides. Sure, absolutely. I don't know if you want. I'm trying to turn my camera back on, but it looks like I can't. Ah, uh, but I, I can I can assure you that I am here. <laughs> and I look <laughs> That's similar right. to the picture. <laughs> especially for a program like machine learning, you just want to make sure you're not the bot, the Noel bot, and, yes. and the real Noel. You know? <laughs> I promise I am a real person. There we go. Okay. There we go. Okay. <laughs> As promised, I'm here. Um, it's so nice to be able to speak to you all. I have a little confession, and that is um, the students who come from India to the U of A are my favorite. <laughs> um, I really have had such a good experience with our Indian students. They come, they're engaged, they're wise, they're bright, they ask great questions. And I have yet to meet a student who's had a negative experience at the U of A. Um, at least from our Indian students, I, I feel like I have a very good connection with them. So it's really a pleasure to be able to speak to you all. I'm I'm calling or I'm zooming in um, to speak about. Oops, sorry, I'm just going to make sure that I change the host to. Okay, I'm speaking on behalf of the International Student Services Office. So you've already heard from two individuals here in this presentation, um, and I am wanting to tell you a little bit more about our office and what we do. So one of the things that you're going to learn through this presentation is that there's a lot of support for you. Okay, in our office alone, the International Student Office, we have close to 20 staff who are dedicated to just supporting international students throughout their journey here at the U, at the U of A. Um, I also graduated from the University of Arizona, did my graduate degree here, and had a really positive experience because of all the support that I received from the different faculty and staff. Um, so our office specializes in assisting international students with that immigration process. And after you've already arrived to the US, just make sure that you have a smooth transition here and a really positive uh, journey towards your degree. So the first, this may or may not be familiar to you all, but I wanted to share some information about the I-20 process. So the I-20 is the immigration document, the F-1 immigration document that you will need to receive from our office to be able to apply for an F-1 student visa at a U.S. embassy or consulate in your home country. Um, so our office assists with this process. My role specifically as one of the associate directors is to be in charge of the support that's given to new students. So you'll personally be working with me and it's so nice to be able to give this presentation because I know that our university is very large, but to be able to have a point person that you can go to for questions is really valuable. 
Um, so the first part of this process will involve you submitting this I-20 request and the documents below to our office. We have a portal that you're going to use uh, called My Global, and the documents that you're going to need to submit to our office include a picture of your passport page, and then funding documents, and a declaration of support if you'll be receiving funding from any of your family or friends. I'll go over some of these funding documents on the, on the next slide, but I just wanted to give you a little bit of an overview of what you'll need to have ready before you request that I-20. It takes our office about 10 business days to process your I-20. That's upon submission of a complete request. So as long as we receive sufficient documentation for you all, we can turn around that I-20 in at, at the most two weeks. So one of the only good things <laughs> about uh, the pandemic is that we have the ability to send the I-20 immigration document electronically to you. So it's no longer a paper document that we need to put in the mail, worry about that getting lost in the mail. This is a huge benefit for everybody that's in the immigration world. Once that I-20 is ready, you receive it in your University of Arizona cap mail. Um, so it's an electronic document. It's electronically signed. You will still need to print it out and sign it when you take it to your visa interview and when you enter the United States. And then since you are all studying um, abroad, we will facilitate that change from your current campus to the main campus that's here in Tucson. So you don't need to worry about doing anything other than requesting the I-20. We will take care of that campus change for you. Next slide, please. So I promised that we would talk about the funding documents because I know that this is a question that's already been popping up in the chat and I wanna make sure that you all understand what we can and we can't accept in terms of funding, okay? So it is our duty as what's called designated school officials um, who have been given permission to issue uh, this immigration document to make sure that you have sufficient funding to be able to support your stay in the United States. So. If there is one slide to maybe take a picture of, <laughs> this is a good one, just so we make sure that you're prepared to submit the, the documents for the I-20. The, certainly the easiest type of funding for us to be able to accept for the I-20 is a checking or savings account that has a statement date that's within the last six months. Okay, It does not have to be a statement showing the last six months of account activity. It just has to have a date on it that's within the last six months uh, when you are submitting that actual document. We can also accept a, a letter that shows that you've been approved for a loan. I know that many of our students do end up receiving an educational loan to be able to support their studies here in the United States. So we accept a letter that shows that you've been approved for that. And then finally, we have many students who are receiving funding from maybe um, an organization or their home government. As long as we have some kind of proof that you have a scholarship and we have an amount that's listed in that letter, we can also apply that amount to the financial guarantee. And it's also important for me to go over the types of funding that we don't accept. Um, so these are the types of funding that we would not be able to count towards the financial guarantee. That includes a statement that's showing your current salary or employment. I know that some of you are currently employed right now. Unfortunately, we cannot accept that because we need to have a proof that you have readily accessible funds, not funds that you will have in the future. Uh, the other types of funds are also not deemed readily accessible. So that includes uh, statements of personal assets, lines of credit, or any kind of statement of a stock bond or bond equity or a retirement account. Um, as always, I know that that's a lot of detail, a lot of information to remember, um, but if you have any doubts about whether or not your financial guarantee is acceptable, there are lots of staff in our office who can help you with that part. Okay, the visa application process. I know there's also been a few questions in the chat about this, so I wanna make sure that you all understand that this is a very common question that we receive. Um, my recommendation for all of you is to be prepared and to just go ahead and check the visa wait times. I went ahead and looked up some of the the main consulates in India to see what the current visa wait time is. And it looks like it ranges from anywhere between 45 to 46 days. Um, so it's been more than that in the past. I'm actually pleased to see this type of processing time. This is actually um, the lowest that it's been, I think, in, in maybe the last year or so. Um, so this date is important because this helps you kind of plan backwards. 
and know how much time to allow yourself to start this process. So oftentimes we'll have students who wait until the very last minute to submit everything. And I just want you all to be aware of this piece because I wanna make sure that this is not an unexpected part of that process and the journey to the United States. Um, other fees that are central to the visa application process that are not given to our office, uh, but to the US government who handles different aspects of the visa application process um, is a $350 CVIS fee that registers your I-20 with the US Department of Homeland Security and then also the visa application um, and fee to the US Department of State that all students have to pay to be able to uh, move on to that next step of that visa interview. So these are not fees that are specific to a, a certain population of students. This is all international students that want to come to the US have to pay these fees to the government. All right, next slide, please. Um, another topic that we receive many questions on is how to prepare for the visa interview. Our office works very closely with the admissions team to present on this. So you're getting a bonus presentation right now um, because we have been presenting this to a lot of new students, just how to feel prepared for that interview. Um, many of us who work on the admissions team have not gone through an interview ourselves. So this is, in, this is information that we've gathered from various sources, including former consular officers and whatnot. Um, there's also information that's available on the US Department of State site, um, but what we can share with you is that you can expect the following. Be prepared with as much documentation as possible. So I spoke earlier about the University of Arizona I-20. That's the immigration document that our office will prepare for you after you've submitted the sufficient financial guarantee and passport page. Um, so make sure that you have your University of Arizona I-20, your admission letter for the program, a valid passport, proof that you've paid that CVIS I-901 fee that I mentioned previously, a photo, uh, some kind of proof that you're academically prepared, um, be able to speak about your intent to depart the US at that current time, be brief, be honest, be concise, um, have all your funding documents ready. Our office also provides a letter of support for all our brand new students. This is a letter that where we are requesting that you are granted, uh, if eligible, a visa and also a smooth entry into the United States. It's uh, a letter that we think might help aid uh, all our students at, during either the visa process or that entry piece at the port of entry. And then of course, every embassy or consulate is a little bit different in terms of the additional documentation they might provide. Um, I can't speak to all the different types of documentation because we work with so many different um, embassies and consulates around the world, um, but you would need to do a little bit of your own research um, to find out what additional paperwork you might need to have at that interview. Um, the takeaway from this slide is really that preparation is key. Um, it's going to be your job to convince the visa officer why you should be granted a visa to study in the US, and you had limited time to be able to present your case. So make sure that you practice, make sure that you feel prepared to do so, practice in front of a mirror, I often tell my students, practice in front of um, you know, your family, a colleague, um, what not, just make sure that you feel prepared to be able to, to speak to that officer and state your case, why you should come to the University of Arizona. All right, I think I'm going to hand it off, is it back to Melind for this next section? Thank you, Noel. And if I may, when it comes to all the practice that you know you uh, put emphasis on, uh, at Great Learning also, we will be helping these students to prepare for their visa interview uh, in their first year itself. As, the, as soon as they have blocked their interview slots, we will be uh, offering them mock interview sessions with us. We will also be sharing some sample interview questions and uh, focusing on their individual profile so that they can do their best when, it, when they're going for their F1 visa interview. That's a really wonderful service, Shweta. Not a lot of our students who are coming to the U of A, <clears throat> excuse me, have that opportunity to be able to practice. So that's a really, really nice service. That's the service that's offered to you all. Um, before we go on to the next slide, I also wanted to speak a little bit about how our, a big part of what we do at the international office is answer questions related to employment. Yes. And I know that there's very specific questions that are in the chat related to CPT and OPT. I wanna speak quickly and generally about that. Um, you have to have one academic year in F1 status to be able to qualify 
um, for practical training. So if you are participating in this program, as long as you graduate in good academic standing, you would be eligible to apply for the standard one year of OPT plus the two years, making a total of three years of OPT in the United States. All right, thank you all. It was nice to speak to you. I think I'm gonna hand it off to the next presenter now. Yep, thanks, Noel. I think um, this is great. Even I learned a lot today uh, on the visa process. Um, and uh, yeah, I think some of you also had uh, questions around the fees. So the total total tuition fees, you know, is thirty four thousand. Uh, we do have some flexibility in terms of the payments plan, and uh, I think the team uh, would be able to answer more around it. I think there were also some questions around, well, you know, can I get a scholarship? So again, there is. Uh, I think the team is looking at certain limited uh, scholarships. So I think. Um, uh, again, uh, Shweta and team uh, would be able to answer those questions. And by the way, if you can't answer all your questions here, uh, each of you has been assigned a program advisor. So they will all get back to you, uh, you know, with uh, any, uh, uh, you know, questions, you know, be it uh, given your unique situation or, or otherwise to help answer those as well. Uh, you know, what you also see here is the team has put together that look uh, you know, to help you better understand uh, you know, one of the one of the uh, uh, the why is behind why we put this program, right? Which was how do we help make this uh, great education cost effective? Uh, so here they, you know, try to help uh, show, you know, how how thanks to the university we've been able to dramatically bring down the cost, right? So if you think about it here, you are, uh, you know, you're almost entire one year of living expenses. Uh, you can add the uh, benefit of being in your home country outside of the US, you know, while you are at home, while you are working, you can continue to get an education and save on those costs. Uh, uh, you know, the, the opportunity cost, which is that, you know, uh, when we all go for education, we, there's something that we give up, which is, you know, we all, most of you are working, right? And that was another thing that this program was designed for. How do we design it so that somebody who has started working and is now realizing the benefits of AI and machine learning and data science in the industry, and is saying, I need to upskill myself. How do you do that without losing your job, without you know uh, uh, losing your paycheck, right? And that's the opportunity cost here, which we are trying to help uh, address. Um, uh, the, the overall costs come down. And I think, uh, you know, of course, the other part is trying to translate what it means in terms of rupees, because, uh, you know, many of you here are joining in from India um, uh, and would also like to know what's the benefit there. So anyway, hopefully that gives you an idea of the total savings uh, and the savings and the opportunity cost, which I think is crucial. Uh, and I want to also add a little bit more about that, because some of you also asked about uh, this question around, well, uh, can I do that that CPT and so on? So, or can I continue to uh, work when I come to the US? Well, so uh, you 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 uh, take you know you cannot do a CPT till you finish uh, or OPT uh, till you finish uh, two semesters. Okay, so two semesters minimum is what you need to finish. Um, we the the program, however, does have a provision for a directed research project. Right, uh, which is going to be overseen by the faculty, by the Arizona faculty. So uh, please talk to us if you have a project in mind that you are working on at your workplace. Uh, the faculty will evaluate whether that project uh, can be considered uh, for, uh, you know, as uh, let's say you want to uh, look at analyzing all the customer support data at your workplace. And uh, you know, use these AI machine learning techniques to try and summarize it, maybe create an automated workflow. That's a very legitimate project that could be considered as a directed research project, right? So there are opportunities to bring your work into your masters, uh, uh, you know, including the directed research project which you'll be doing in the US. So please reach out to your program advisor to learn more about it, but there are those opportunities. Um, uh, but, uh, uh, you know, in lieu of like a CPT or OPT, the CPT, OPT, to be clear, you cannot do that till you have finished officially two semesters uh, on the campus. Yeah, um, uh, you know, a little bit about the great learning, you know, great learning has been partnering with Arizona to help bring this program to life, right, and make it easy for all of you to, uh, to get started. So everything from helping you understand the whole admission process, because I know it can be pretty, uh, pretty stressful, uh, as, uh, you know, Shweta mentioned, also guiding you through that whole visa process, right, kind of handholding you around how to go about that whole visa process, because again, 
for many of us, you know, it's a completely new new thing, right? And there are multiple entities. There's the university, there's, there's you, there's the embassy, right? The US embassy. So how do you, you know, what are the steps and, you know, how to go about uh, that journey? Um, a program team. So what will happen is right now you have for the admissions, you have a program advisor who's going to be coaching you on everything from, you know, how do you fill the application in that letter of recommendation, that statement of purpose, filling up the form and so on. Right. But uh, it doesn't stop there. And then your program starts. And when your program starts, you know, we are all busy working professionals. How do you manage to do your work? Many of you have a family and the family at home. And guess what? A whole new master's degree, right? And from a very from a top school like Arizona, right, which is uh, you know a very demanding program. So that's why you have your program advice. Your uh, you, each of you will have a program manager uh, who will be kind of handholding you through that journey, right? Helping you with whether it's you know you projects or assignments, you know deadlines, what be what it may. Even you know you fall sick, COVID, etc. How do you navigate, you know, your masters while all that is happening, right? Um, and I think there are, yeah, we uh, also have some, uh, uh, you know, for some of you who may not have a background in in Python programming, uh, in statistics, or maybe you do, but if you're like me, I did that back in in college, and you know, now it's twenty years in the workforce, and I probably. Um, uh, I'm kind of now beginning to realize how little I know when I had to teach my son probability and statistics for his high school math, right? So if you're anyone like me, you know, we also provide these kind of pre-work courses to help you get up to speed so that once you see that once the courses start, you can hit the ground running, right? So these are additional programs that courses that great learning will provide you know, for free as part of this whole master's program. So our goal here is to make sure that you are successful, right? A program like from Arizona is, is demanding. It's, it's a top university program, and that comes with a lot of rigor, a lot of expectations. But we are there to, you know, uh, be with you along the journey and, and take you all the way to the finish line. Um, if you go to the next slide, yep. And I think with that, what I will do is I'll uh, uh, open it up for any questions. I know there are a few questions and some of them have already been answered. Um, again, uh, you will all have a program advisor if you don't have one already. You know, they are your best guide, at least till you get started in, into the course. Once you're in the course, they, you will have a program manager assigned to you as well, who will then help you through the rest of the journey. So feel free to reach out to them. Um, or you can also email here, the email that you see here. Yeah. With that, um, uh, maybe we can, uh, Shweta, do you want to Milan, just maybe, for questions? Yeah, yeah, yeah. We have quite a few questions and perhaps I can uh, start with most common, common questions that we get from the students. So, um, Milan, you talked about the directed research and uh, Capstone Project is very much part of the curriculum of this program. So yes. can you please, you know, if uh, you yourself or Anil can answer how Capstone projects and other industry-based projects, which are very much part of this program, can help with respect to the job search. As we know yes. that this program does not have so-called internship, but many other things. So how does it compensate for internship and gives that edge to the students in the job market? Yes, yes, that's a great question. Uh, and maybe I'll get started. Anil, feel free to uh, pitch in uh, with any additional points. But there are two things I want to bring up, right? In fact, uh, uh, to, to, to bring up two, uh, you know, what Shweta just mentioned, which is that, look, uh, you know, I, I, after my two semesters in the US, I'll be starting on my OPT. Uh, you know, and I haven't, uh, OPT, by the way, is like a, you know, it's like an uh, official internship, right? It's a three year long uh, visa that you get. To work at a company um, and of course uh, after that uh, you know if like in my case I started on my OPT first I, I, I was like many of you aspiring to come to the U.S. I came here for my education for my master's after that I too got my OPT in fact I started working at a startup uh, which later on got acquired by a larger company and then you know they uh, converted my OPT to what they call as an H1B uh, and then that H1B eventually got converted to what they call as a green card. And eventually today I'm a citizen. So that's just my journey, right? Um, but uh, back to Shweta's point, well, but uh, you know, there's no internship here. So how do I compensate for that? So two things I want to bring up. 
One is that in that first year, many of you are likely working. We want you to work. Right, we want you to continue to work. In fact, you'll also see in the classes that those mentors will try to encourage you to think about how to take each of those concepts, that class on NLP, natural language processing, or those you know large language models and GPT-4 and all that. How do you take that to your, bring it to your work? That class on you know a data visualization or data mining. How do you use that to look at you know projects at work? Right. So the uh, focus is always on keep working, keep earning. And most importantly, see if you can bring what you're studying into your work. So that's number one. You know, you will have a huge advantage if you were to apply for an OPT and for a job, knowing, you know, that, you know, this is a person who, unlike somebody who just did two years of master's, this is a person who in their first year did their master's and they worked and had real life work experience. And that counts for a lot, right? Trust me, take this from somebody who's not just gone through the process but also has uh, hired people who finish their masters as well, right? We all know the value of work experience on your resume. That's number one. The second thing is the capstone project and or you also have the option when you come to the US to also do a directed research project. Both of these are designed so that you can work on projects which are more industry oriented, right? And that's for a reason. The faculty have put it there especially for a program like this, because they see the value of, you know, not just learning something from academia, but being able to show that you can put it to use in the industry, right? So there are projects, uh, again, uh, various kinds. You saw some examples of it. For exa example, a project on how do you use, uh, you know, uh, uh, NLP and, you know, all these technologies like LLMs and GPT, to do business process automation at, at a workplace, right? Or, or a project on, you know, how do you use machine learning to look at, um, uh, you know, the outbreak of, uh, well, using COVID data, um, you know, supplied from the NIH, how do you use that to predict patterns on when the next outbreak will happen, right? These are all AI slash machine learning related projects. And the, these are just a couple of examples of the many, many, which are very applicable to the industry and why that's important is we want you all to not just have a degree but also have real life work experience that you can take with you to the job interview right and i think we'll also be talking a little bit about uh, to the program how do you position yourself uh, in the job market you know so that it's important that you know all these skills it's even more important that the world knows you know all these skills right and and, and we we help you understand how to how to tell that story about about what you do uh, but th that, that's a little bit about capstone and directed research. Anil, do you want to add anything here? You know, the only thing I want to add really is that the projects uh, that the faculty at the university, uh, the different departments like uh, MIS or machine learning, IS school or the MBA programs, we have a lot of partnerships with different companies and different um, uh, institutions uh, across the U.S. So a lot of the directed research projects you might be working on would be in, in some way related to some existing company that has been selected by the faculty. And consequently, you develop a lot of contacts and you do some real life uh, projects that are relevant on an ongoing basis on issues and topics that are being discussed or being uh, used at a particular company. So uh, consequently, you are uh, working inside a company in many cases, and therefore, as you graduate, then you have some links to then uh, use that project experience to then, uh, you know, be recommended uh, for, a, for a starting level job after you get your OPT. So these are uh, great advantages because the faculty has, you know, built a lot of relationship with different companies as well. Thank you so much, Anil and Milind. Uh, I'll quickly take a couple of questions from the chat here. Uh, Mr. Devish is asking, what is the course requirement? So in terms of eligibility, I can guide you that 120 credit points is what we look for in your undergrad or whatever you have done before, maybe an undergrad and postgraduate together. You need to have 120 credit points. And if you're not able to figure that out, do not worry. You have the email ID in front of you. Send your transcripts to us and your program advisor, your assigned program advisor will be able to calculate that for you and will be able to guide you accordingly. Along with uh, 120 credit points, we also look for certain GPA that has to be three CGPA over four. If you have anything less than that, then also there is a solution. 
again, like I said, please reach out to us either on the phone or on the email and we'll be able to guide you further. There's one more question. What are the timings in IST for the first year component, the online classes? Uh, Mr. Bhaskar, that's going to be very much in, uh, you know, uh, in the late evenings in India, say around 7.30 or 8 p.m. And University of Arizona faculty is very kind to accommodate this, accommodate IST timings for our students. And they are available at that time to conduct the live sessions for us. Now I have a question for Noel. Um, I hope we still have her. Uh, so Noel, there is a question. If you can please guide our students a little bit more on the part-time job opportunities available on the campus. And if they are restricted uh, in their second year to work for part-time jobs only on the campus or if they can go out as well, please let us know. Yeah, thank you so much, Weta. And thank you all for asking that great question. So. Um, all international students are eligible to work on campus without needing any additional permission from our office, okay? So really important for you all to know, you don't need to come to our office and ask if you, if you need to get approval from us before working on campus. Plenty of our students work on campus, and if you can find an opportunity um, that works for you, that's, you know, will help towards your cost of living, or even better, that is, a, is somehow um, applicable to your degree or the skills that you already have, that's great. Um, so there's plenty of positions on campus that students apply for. Um, like I said, it's limited to on campus, but that means you could be working in a department. You could be working in an academic department. You could be working for some of the support services that are located on campus too. So we have a lot of different tutoring centers as well, the library, our student union, which has a lot of different restaurants and and bookstores, um, those are pretty popular places for our students to secure on-campus employment. I know that um, a, a very common first step for students who are interested in on-campus employment is checking out the U of A database called Handshake. So Handshake is a, 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 a search platform that the U of A has that lists um, all the different options for on-campus, also off-campus employment too, um, but you are limited to on-campus um, for at least that first year while you're in um, still in your program. So I want to reiterate that too. Malin spoke to this as well. Um, you're not eligible for any type of practical training off-campus until after you've completed that one year here on campus. But the on-campus opportunities are available to you. Yes. Thank you, Noel. Noel, will it be possible for you to quickly mention, uh, on an average, what these part-time, uh, what are the part-time wages for these students, on an average, please? Ah, uh, I, I don't have <laughs> um, a good average to speak to there. It really varies depending on the department. There's a lot of different classifications of work uh, when it comes to student employment in general. So there's a huge range. <coughs> Of, of different wages. I don't know, Anil, were you going to, did you have something to say there? I wasn't sure. <laughs> I saw you too. Yeah, I was just going to mention, Noel, that most of the jobs, you know, on campus will, will probably pay you at least, you know, $15 an hour or maybe even more. And now sometimes if they are research oriented jobs that you can find in hundreds of different departments, they're always looking for uh, assistants, research assistants that uh, professors are doing projects and so on, they can even pay you uh, significantly more. But um, nevertheless, if you're working 20 hours a week, you know, you can expect to make at least, you know, three to three to three hundred and fifty dollars a week. Um, and of course, you know, subject to some of the deductions and so on. So if you're working for a whole month or you're working for 10 hours or 15 hours, you can calculate very easily uh, some of the funds that you can uh, use, you know, for your living expenses, obviously based upon your uh, study schedule, you know, the, the workload you have in terms of your academic requirements. Yeah. Thank yeah, you so much, Anna. Really good information. Oh, sorry. <laughs> yeah, the minimum wage in Arizona is, is 1385, I believe. So it's going to be at least that. But like Anil was saying, there's a, it, it's 1385 and up. It really depends on the type of position that you get. Um, and just as Anil was mentioning earlier, um, having an on-campus job is a really great way to network <laughs> um, across campus. So if you do find some kind of research position in your department, 
that's an even better way to kind of make those networks there. Um, you might you might be thinking you're just going to a job to earn a little bit extra money, but those networks are very valuable. Yes. I would also add one other thing here, which is, you know, thanks to the university, you have another big advantage, which is, you know, as you get also access to handshake, right? So as soon as the program starts, uh, when you're, even when you're in your home country, uh, you know, literally one year before you actually come to campus, you have the advantage of using handshake, which has, as, uh, you know, Noel mentioned, uh, a lot of these on-campus opportunities being listed. So that's, I would highly encourage a lot of you to take advantage of that, right? It's a unique opportunity uh, that uh, becomes, you know, uh, uh, <clears throat> special to this hybrid program where you can network with say, uh, you know, the department head at a particular, uh, in a particular department who has a certain opening, uh, who may have got a grant and is saying, I'm looking for somebody to help me out here, you know, some kind of a, a graduate teacher's assistant uh, and so on. So uh, a great opportunity, something that you should all definitely take the advantage of uh, through Handshake, which is again, for those of you who may not know, Handshake is this platform that's available, that's the University of Arizona has made available for, uh, you know, networking and finding your way through job openings for on campus, off campus when you're ready for it. Uh, and, you know, when you want an OPT job or even after that, uh, basically even throughout your career, even as an alumni, if you're looking for jobs later down in your career, right? So that's what Handshake is for. Thank you, Belen, for mentioning that. Um, so I have a related question. Many a time students are concerned will, when we go to US as a student via hybrid mode, will we be treated differently or will the opportunities available for us are going to be exactly as same as the students who would have gone to the campus since day one? So I'd like to request you or uh, Professor Anil to please address that. Yeah, I think that's a that's a fair question that students ask, and uh, you will be treated exactly the same as uh, any other student that has come here uh, for a full time program, uh, for a two year program. You know, if you come here in the first year or you come here in the second year, as part of the hybrid program, you'll still be treated the same. You will still have a wonderful Noel to support you and uh, help you with all your documentation. And all our amazing staff at the Arizona International Office, uh, we will welcome you with open arms. Um, you will not be treated any different. Uh, all the resources that Milan mentioned, all of those are available to you, whether you come, you know, uh, first year or you come in the second year in the hybrid. Uh, and uh, of course, you know, you'll have, have all the advantages of the beautiful campus we have here uh, in Tucson. Thank you so much, Anil. Also, the degree that you students get via hybrid format also is exactly the same as that of the full-time on-campus degree program. Uh, the format is only hybrid, but the degree is exactly the same because the rigor of the program is also not getting diluted at any point. In the first year also, you are expected to put in work, put in effort, uh, your dedication, commitment, and the fruit of it you get towards the end of the program has exactly the same degree like I mentioned. That is true, Shweta. And one of the things to remember is that if you do not, if you do not maintain your grade point average of 3.0 in the first year, you will not be able to then get into the second year of the hybrid program. You might have to take some more remedial courses uh, to get eligible for the second year hybrid program. Thank you so much, Anil. This is where Great Learning's program team will come into picture and we'll right. do a lot of uh, hand-holding and we'll ensure that our students are gaining the required CGPA and a lot more experience, which uh, gives them, which develops a solid foundation for them before they travel to campus. Now, I have a question over here. Is it compulsory to come to campus in the second year? Uh, so let me also tell you guys that we have the same program available in a completely online format as well. So there is a hybrid format and and there is a completely online format. So some of you who are not able to go to campus in the second year will have the opportunity to finish the entire program online as well. And again, the degree that you would get towards the end of this completely online program is also going to be exactly the same. Only thing is you will not have an uh, F1 visa to go to US, but that is a possibility for sure. Yes. Okay. I would also add one more thing here, which is, you know, life happens. Let's say you wanted to come to the US, but, you know, something went wrong. Um, 
you know, in the worst case, and, uh, you know, Noel could probably uh, add a little bit more about the stat she has seen about, you know, students uh, coming to the campus. Uh, but at the same time, we all acknowledge that, uh, you know, um, getting a visa at the U.S. Embassy is nothing is guaranteed, right? Nothing is guaranteed in life. However, what we do have the advantage of is a top-notch university like University of Arizona, and that makes a big difference. Uh, so uh, I'll uh, request in a bit, uh, you know, Noel to share any stats she may have or experience she may have seen of students who apply for a visa to come to campus. Uh, what I uh, did want to bring up, though, is whether you, you know, something happens on the visa front uh, or, you know, you just say, look, uh, I have a lot going on. I want to continue finishing up a project before I come to the U.S. This program also gives you that flexibility where let's say you said, all right, I want to uh, come to campus in fall of next year. Right. And then uh, your boss at your work says, look, you got to meet this project deadline. It's a big opportunity. You got to stay here. Let's say you're in Bangalore and finish that off before you go to U.S. Well, you can always then move your arrival date to the following spring uh, and continue from spring onwards. And if even if that's not a possibility, the following fall, right, and so on. Uh, I believe um, the exact number is you have up to five years, and I can double check on that, but I think you have up to five years to finish that master's eventually, right? Uh, so you have that flexibility as well. Um, with that, Noel, would you have any thoughts on stats around uh, you know, students, especially from India, given a large uh, number of students here are from there, who, are, who apply for a visa to, you know, to come to University of Arizona for master's, uh, any experience on, you know, um, uh, how, uh, if visas, like, how likely are they to get a visa or, or something around that? Yeah, I'm, I'm sorry, I don't have a specific uh, statistical figure for visa approval rates from India. It, um, not all of our students will tell us if they're approved or denied. They just, they come <laughs> if they receive the visa. Um, I can say that it sounds like the program that is offered is very flexible. So we, we definitely work with you all in the case that you're not able to get a visa um, and coach you through different options. So it sounds like this program is flexible and that if you do need to delay your start by a semester um, or need to, I don't know, maybe, uh, switch to the online program, that seems like that might be an option as well. So we definitely get a lot of questions from students about, hey, the visa wait time is too long, what are my options? Or um, I was denied for visa, what can I do here? Um, we always encourage students to, to reapply if possible, but always with new information. We know that this is something that happens, but unfortunately it's something that's a little bit out of our control. I think what you have going for you is something that Melange also already um, emphasize, which is that the U of A is a research one, top-notch university. And I think that, um, you know, when you're going into that interview, I think that speaks a lot to the legitimacy of the, of the institution that you're planning to attend. So I think that does help a lot. Awesome. Thank you, Noel. Um, there is one more question. And if I may request uh, Anil and Melin to take that. Uh, students, you know, again, we have sort of answered this question that, you know, downside of OPT in comparison to CPT. I think what student wants to ask is, uh, I do not have a CPT over here. Will I be able to make use of OPT by getting a job? So I think we have answered this question, but Milind, would you like to add something to it? Um, yeah, so uh, I guess the question is uh, downside of uh, uh, OPT versus CPT. Uh, you know, and uh, Noel, Anil, uh, feel free to pitch in, but the way at least, uh, and I'll speak from a student perspective, because I went through that process, right? Uh, OPT, you know, CPT is, uh, I think, both allow you to work. Uh, the OPT allows you to work after you finish your master's. The CPT is something that allows you to work, as I, I believe you need to do a minimum of one year uh, on campus. After which, you know, if you're continuing to do more years on campus, your CPT can kick in to allow you to work, you know, in those summers in the in in between semesters and stuff, right? So you can uh, work while uh, while you still haven't finished your masters. In this particular program, since you are going to be finishing your masters in two semesters once you come to the U.S., you basically don't need a CPT. 
right? You can directly jump to the OPT. So that's one benefit of this program, right? You can directly jump to the OPT. The OPT brings you this additional benefit, which is you get an OPT, especially given that this is a STEM degree, uh, right? A, a science, technology, engineering degree. You The OPT is valid for three years, right? Um, and opposed to say, if it was a business degree, uh, which would typically be one year. So you have three years of OPT. In other words, three years of continuing to work in the US. Uh, uh, and then of course, if uh, you like the job that you are at, if the job likes you, you can also, uh, what students typically do, what I did was I started on an OPT, my, you know, did well. And then the company decided to sponsor my H1B. And then after a few years, I continued to do well. They said, okay, now we'll sponsor your green card. And then eventually after five years of that, I got my citizenship. Does that answer the question about OPT versus CPT? Um, I don't know, Noel, Anil, if you want to add anything here. Yeah, I mean, the CPT is not something that you're eligible for on, on, in this program if you're only going to be on campus for one year. So we, our focus is really OPT. Um, OPT is performed in general after you've completed your degree. Um, so it's really the opportunity to be able to engage in work after degree completion um, that is a huge advantage of, of doing this program. Um, CPT, I, you know, in, in, I think in most cases, since if you will be finishing in one year, you will not be eligible for CPT, but it sounds like there are other opportunities for you to be able to get that experience in your field. So um, like was, en was mentioned previously, the direct research or the capstone project will allow you to get some of that direct experience that you would otherwise get during C using a CPT. Also, like Anil mentioned earlier, that University of Arizona is associated with many top leading organizations. And University of Arizona also conducts quite a few career fairs regularly on the campus. So once these hybrid students are on the campus, they will be able to participate in the same, will, will, uh, will be able to have that interaction, will be able to present their candidature to these leading organizations. To, if you are asking if you are at any disadvantage, the answer is totally no. No, you are getting a degree which is very relevant in demand today in the uh, in the industry uh, with a curriculum which is extremely latest with a lot of practical exposure. How would you be at disadvantage by gaining all this experience? Thank you, Noel. I have a few questions which we'll quickly take. Uh, it's about scholarship. So yes, how do you apply for scholarship? How much scholarship is there? Please reach out to us over email or phone and because that needs a detailed discussion and we'll be able to guide you over there. Um, how do we need to apply for the program and when it starts? So our upcoming batch is July. Uh, July 3rd is when the next batch is starting. And after that, there is a cohort plan for October. Um, to apply for that, right now, applications are open. And what you need to do is to reach out to us with your basic documents. Those documents are going to be your transcripts, your uh, degree certificate. If you have SOP, then please send it. Otherwise, we will help you write one. Uh, and then uh, your CV. So once you send all these documents to us, we will be able to assess your eligibility for the program and guide you accordingly. Um, okay, so what does minimum OPT visa students get? Yes, because this is a STEM degree, you are eligible to get an OPT visa for up to three years. Um, you get first for one year, which is the basic OPT visa, and after that you can apply for extension in case you haven't got any H-1B as yet. So that's a possibility, it being a STEM degree. Mandatory academic requirements to be able to do this course, like I mentioned earlier, that's 120 credit points. You can be from any domain. You can be a mechanical engineer, you can be a pharmaceutical um, a graduate. And uh, because you know, when you talk about this is a machine learning program and you talk about data, which is uh, relevant and applicable in most of the domains today. So we have students who have a background in robotics and now they are planning to make a career in AI or machine learning. Maybe they are looking for to 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 you know go for uh, uh, you know auto driven cars. Uh, there is a lot of uh, application, like Milan mentioned in the beginning of this presentation. If you can be from a banking sector, you can be from retail or entertainment, for that matter, sports and machine learning and artificial intelligence is going to be absolutely applicable over there. 
Okay. Um, if you get rejected in visa, like Noel mentioned, they always advise to stu advise students to reapply. Um, although we will be uh, minimizing as many chances as possible for visa rejections by checking that all your documents are in place before you go for the interview. We will prepare you for the interview. Even after that, if unfortunate thing happens, you can apply again. Or worst case, you can finish this entire degree program in an online format as well. How is the GPA going to be calculated? Uh, and uh, will we be having similar semester exams as compared to doing this program from campus? So um, to answer that, faculty has uh, their own way of assessing students even in the first year. Uh, it doesn't have to be a semester exam, but there are multiple ways uh, which the faculty actually uses to assess students for different courses. That can be projects, that can be assignments, or quizzes as well. So once you are enrolled in the program, you will be uh, definitely, you know, briefed about it, how you are going to be assessed in a particular subject. Okay, there is a question which I would request perhaps Anil to take. What is the difference between College of Science and College of Behavioral Sciences at University of Arizona? Um, the College of Science is more uh, focused around, you know, degrees which are related to specifically computer science, and then uh, College of Information Science, which is part of the course College of Social Sciences or Behavioral Sciences, is more related towards <clears throat> specific degrees around different parts of the industry, which could be related to data, which could be related to behavioral sciences and so on so you can get further details around that uh, on the on the websites for the two different colleges thank you anil i have another question yeah, here which add, i feel yes please. i'll just add you know so that's behavioral science but in addition you know the information school the i school which is now like a, a separate department was uh, uh, designed to be this interdisciplinary uh, you know uh, school, right? So that one encompasses, in fact, it has uh, kind of joint faculty from other uh, departments as well. Uh, that's another thing I wanted to bring up, which is that when you do come to campus, you will also have the opportunity to do some electives, uh, which can be from other departments. So from the CS school for the, for the AKA the School of Sciences, uh, or from the engineering school. Um, in fact, the I school is also strategically positioned right next to the engineering school, right? So that you know you can potentially also, uh, you know, take uh, 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 courses across these other departments as well. So that's uh, that's the information school, which is uh, by design designed to be uh, interdisciplinary. It does have <coughs> faculty who come from the social sciences, from the behavioral sciences, from computer science, uh, and from um, uh, you know engineering school as well. Thank you, Milan. That was very important uh, point over here because this program comes from iSchool and sometimes students do get confused uh, that, you know, how come this program can be part of uh, Behavioral Science College. So thank you for clarifying that over here. Uh, there is a question if uh, professors teach from the very basic or from the scratch. So there is good news that, yes, first of all, the program is designed to take you through the entire journey of data analysis, starting from data collection to cleaning it up, to warehousing it, then building algorithms and scaling up the same. But even before your course starts, if you're enrolling in this hybrid program, our program team has designed a pre-course work, which is going to help you develop some foundation for yourself before you enter the master's degree. So there, that is the assistance available. And as you saw in one of our previous slides, there is a complementary learning package, which is also designed by Great Learning, which has modules on cloud computing, um, SQL basics, and also a couple of analytics platforms, which are not part of your curriculum, but you're getting it complementary again to give you an edge in the job market. And of course, the first year when you are learning online, you are absolutely allowed to work full time. That is also an experience which is going to further help you. Okay. 
criteria eligibility for the scholarship like i said there is a link called scholarship universe from university of arizona you will be able to explore scholarships for the second year using that link you can explore that once you have the offer letter from the university in the first year the scholarship is based on the payment mode so once please get in touch with us and uh, we will be able to help you further on that uh, there is a question, Noel, would you be able to please help over here? There is a student who's on H4 visa and she is asking if she's eligible for the program. In my opinion, she will have to change her visa to F1 before she applies. Please uh, help me, uh, you know, uh, add something to it. If I'm wrong, please let me know. Sure. Yeah, that's a, that's a good question. Thank you for asking that. Um, H4 visa holders are permitted to study in the U.S. Um, so you can enroll in the program on an H-4 visa, but you're not permitted to work. So um, if you are at all interested in being able to utilize and apply for the OPT uh, after graduation, then you would need to make sure that you are in an F-1 visa for at least one academic year before being eligible for that OPT. I hope that answers the question. <laughs> yes, absolutely, Noel. Thank you so much. Approximate cost for the program, uh, like you saw in one of the previous slides, the hybrid program total program fee is around 34,000 US dollars for first year plus second year. It is distributed between the first year and the second year, and we'll be able to give you a breakup uh, when you are speaking to the program advisor. In addition to this program cost, you will have to add one year of living expenses if you're doing this program in a hybrid format. Uh, so one year of living expenses in uh, Tucson, Arizona is going to be approximately 18,000 to 20,000 US dollars, please. Admissions are open, like I mentioned, that we have admissions open for July 2023 and October 2023. The earlier you start, the better it is for you, because like Anil mentioned that the job market when it comes to machine learning and data science and artificial intelligence right now is absolutely booming um Milind also talked about chat gpt chat gpt is by the which is one ai applications there are more than 2000 ai applications which were released in the market um in the beginning of this year so the opportunities are plenty and it would definitely be in your favor if you are um you know doing a master's degree right on time and making use of all those opportunities in the market right now Program needs IELTS for Pakistani nationals. Uh, so Azra, please allow us to get back to you on that. University has a list uh, on their platform where it is very clearly mentioned IELTS is required for which nationals and which not. For Indians, it's certainly not required, but for Pakistani nationals, we will have to check and let, uh, let you know. So we will get back to you over email for this. This course is very much a STEM course. Um, how about the 90 days time frame after completing the course? I mean, yeah, you will have to find a job in 90 days after finishing the course, but uh, we have talked enough about it, how university offers a very elaborated career assistance over here. 